And we are on the air and we are recording. And I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the Restoring Health for a Healthy Future webinar series. My name is Nicole Francis. I'm Migma and I'm tuning in from uh, so-called Belfast, Maine in uh, Wabanaki territory and specifically um, Penobscot territory. Um, we're part of the same confederacy here. Um, I spent my lovely winter morning out uh, gathering some winter bark for bark baths and teas, and it's been a, a really beautiful day so far, and I'm really excited to log in uh, with everyone here for um, this uh, webinar series uh, hosted by the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance in partnership with the Traditional Native American Farmers Association. And uh, NAFSA has been re doing really amazing work over the years, organizing um, with uh, restoring the food systems and supporting indigenous self-determination, wellness, cultures, values, communities, economies, languages, and families while rebuilding relationships with the land, water, plants, and animals that sustain us. And TNAFA, the Traditional Native American Farmers Association, uh, is, uh, has a mission to revitalize traditional agriculture for spiritual and human need by creating awareness and support for Native environmental issues. And the founder, Clayton Braskupe, um, may already be logged in or hopefully he is logging in soon, so he'll be here too to um, watch the webinar and perhaps ask some questions later on. We are going to save um, Q&A for the end um, the end of the webinar, but if you have questions, feel free to type them in at any time and we'll keep, we'll keep track of them. Um, and uh, we're really excited to bring to you this uh, seventh webinar in the 10 part series, Seeds of Kinship, Nurturing Ancestral Connections and Indigenous Birth Work. Um, for those who are just joining, um, if you'd like to put in the chat what land or territory you're joining from um, and who you are, we'd love to hear from you. I just want to start us out with uh, in a good way um, and just uh, recognize all of the ancestors um, that have come before us to bring us where we're at right now um, and all the uh, beautiful kinship and uh, trade waves that we're able to reignite now because of all of the the love and the prayers and the hard work that they put in and that we're able to come together as relatives, as human relatives and non-human relatives to, um, to reignite, re-engage and to come together to learn from one another, to um, have this beautiful kinship that I know that happens in um, beautiful ways locally and also um, throughout the territories when we can jump on webinars like this. Hello? Oh, I thought I heard something. Just wanted to check in. Um, and I just want to in invite that beautiful um, spirit and that beautiful energy in from, from all of those prayers that have brought us to where we are today as we listen to Sebon Glenda um, talk about uh, kinship through indigenous birth work um, and how we nourish ourselves um, and in this time of life. And I want to start out um, with introducing Sewa. Um, Sewa Yuli is a mixed indigenous UMA, Purepecha traditional health practitioner, community based cook, full spectrum birth keeper, and indigenous food activist rooted in anti oppressive values. Sebo's focus is centered on traditional holistic practices, reproductive autonomy, preservation of ancestral food ways, and food justice advocacy. Through Mishan Tico, Sewa emphasizes on making healthy food and healing modalities accessible, centering communities of color, experiencing health disparities, and using food education and connection to land-based ways to empower and self-determination. Sewa offers full spectrum birth support, ancestral nourishment, catering services, cooking classes, and nutrition support. And um, I've been um, very blessed and um, feel um, really thankful and have a lot of gratitude for the work that Sewa does in communities and have been able to be there for 
um, for on the ground work with um, birthing uh, community members and seeing the work that that Sewa offers and Sewa does for for our community. And I'm I'm so honored that we can hear from Sewa today. And um, I'm going to open the floor for Glenda to do um, their introduction. So then, say, ni se asun Glenda Abbe de Gua Sipitigo Piesusco, Nehiao Nia Oche Chachikeo Sataigan, Nimiwiti Nota et Gotian, at the Tamsko Kumusumuog. My name is Glenda Abbott. I'm planning to create from Pelican Lake First Nation. Both my parents are from there. Um, and my ancestral home is a place called Otter Lake, which is really uh, close to there, um, but not the actual First Nation. So we have a really big kind of ancestral territory. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Um, I guess like my work in the last seven or so years has been really focused around supporting Indigenous led community based um, projects and organizations and doing workshops and, and uh, capacity building like from the grassroots up and, um, and really allowing people to stay in their communities to do their work and not have to leave and go to university somewhere else and do all these other things. Um, and part of that work has brought me to the Indigenous Birth Justice Network, um, which I'll give a shout out to in a little bit. Um, and then the other part is working with First Nations in the um, Plains, uh, the Canadian Plains territories um, around rebuilding food sovereignty systems and um, Buffalo. I do a lot of work with Buffalo, which I get to talk a little bit about today. So thank you for having me. And hi, Clayton. Hi, Clayton. Hey. Hello. Hi, I just got here. All right, <laughs> it's good to see you. All right. I just wanted um, to share something really quick. Oh, oh go for it. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just hi, everybody. It's such an honor to be here. Uh, thank you, uh, Nikki, for introducing me. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about meeting Glenda and why I'm super happy and excited to have her. I mean, I think it was, I don't know, like seven, eight years ago, uh, met in Washington at the Indigenous uh, Birth Keepers Gathering. And then we've met in different various, we even like traveled in Hawaii for like two weeks, <laughs> which was amazing. And then um, we also got to spend some time in Mexico, in Jalisco, in Tonalá, with the indigenous uh, traditional uh, parteras, midwives out there, and we got to learn together. So it's it's really exciting to to be here and like to to share with you. Thanks for sharing that, Sila. Yeah, thank <clears throat> you. And uh, uh, I would like to introduce myself because they're like. People are probably like, who's the person in this you know, talking? <laughs> um, yeah, please uh, do. So, yeah, to everybody, uh, Mariah Ashley in this year, she adds in Ajani Nishle, Tanasani Bush's team, Nakai Deshiche, Adoki, Ali Deshanele. I am the media uh, and design coordinator for NAFSA. So, um, I helped put this webinar together and I'll be monitoring the chat. If you have any questions, um, feel free to put it in there. We are doing a question and answer at the end of the webinar. Um, but yeah, I just thought I'd introduce myself and welcome everybody. Yeah. All right. And I know um and, and I forgot to ask you this when we when we first met up, Mariah, but are we set up so that we could do a draw like we've done in the past? Um, like picking from the names. Oh yeah, we could do that. Okay. I know Clayton likes to um so everyone that's joining us right now, we could will be able to pick a name. From there, and we'll email you and Clayton lights to send out a package of some really beautiful um, things from from his territory, some foods and and things like that. And um, mm -hmm. I, where I only were joining in, there wasn't that many people here, so I'll just reintroduce myself. Um, I'm Nicole Francis, and I'm joining from Penobscot ter territory. I'm Nigama, and um, Penobscot territory is part of the Confederacy that I'm part of here in Wabanaki and I'm in so called Belfast, Maine, right on the coastal waters this morning. And um, we're really excited to hear from everyone. Uh, we're gonna wait till um, the end of the presentation to have a Q&A, but feel free to put things in, let us know um, how things are making you feel and think and stuff that's coming up for you. We'd love to, to use those to further the conversation that we're having here today. And um, we are going to start um, with a trailer of a video 
um, of a movie that SOA is working on. So SOA, if you want to give us a little background on that, we'd love to hear about it. I'm really excited to see the trailer. And I think everyone else is going to be really excited for this trailer too. I'll let you let everyone know um, how long it is. And um, then after the trailer, we'll get into some more conversation. Awesome, thank you. <sighs> I'm a little nervous about it because it's like my first time showing it, but um, it was inspired by um, Dr. Sintley. Uh, one of his stories and originally it was going to be like a smart a short story about just uh, our corn stories but then it expanded and it kind of turned into its like own thing so I want you to watch it and then I would love to discuss more about it after yeah great I'll pull that up <clears throat> thank you mm -hmm. I can figure that out <laughs> okay okay um, this one here. <clears throat> cool. Can you all see it? Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Yeah, can we hear it? Can hear it. El primero, cualquiera que sea la religión. I can't hear it. Can anyone else hear it? Yeah, I can't I hear can. it and it's kind of breaking up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I can't hear it either. One second. <clears throat> so you can't hear it? No, we, I could now, but maybe you might want to rewind it to the beginning. Okay. Todo ser humano debemos tener tres encuentros en la vida. El primero, cualquiera que sea la religión, debemos estar en paz con Dios. El segundo, con uno mismo, Y el tercero con lo que nos rodea. Siendo conscientes de eso, no nos debemos de olvidar donde estamos parados, que es la Pachamama, la tierra, la tierra que nos abraza todos los días, nos da alimento. Y a veces somos muy malagradecidos, porque una de las primeras cosas que nos debemos agradecer es a la tierra, que de ahí vienen todos los alimentos. The children of migrants that came to the United States were more likely to get sick or develop uh, diet related illnesses because of assimilation, right? And so that, you know, I remember, you know, being in class and saying, oh my God, this is me and this is my children. So I had like that, you know, aha moment. It was like, oh no, I have to make sure that I keep myself healthy and my family healthy by eating the foods that my mother and my father grew up eating. Este, yo creo que un pueblo que es este, alimentado con productos buenos, de buena calidad, es un pueblo que tiene posibilidades de mantener su propia historia, su cultura, su tradición, todo eso, ¿no? Desde chiquita, mis papás sembraban maíz, frijoles, calabacitas. En estas épocas, cuando no había mucho trabajo, pues, aunque hubiera tortillas con sal, con eso sobrevivíamos. Entonces, para mí, la milpa, el maíz... Es vida. Por eso cuando nos dicen de que la, la, la ruralidad ya no es un tema importante, de, digo yo, bueno, ¿y quién produce los alimentos? ¿Quién los va a producir? ¿La agroindustria? ¿Lo va a producir todo? Los, trans, los que usan transgénicos, agroquímicos, todo eso, pues tal vez lo produzcan, pero ¿qué van a dejar en el medio ambiente? No van a dejar ya nada. No le podemos dar esa confianza al sistema agroalimentario este, industrial. Todos esos químicos, agroquímicos que Estados Unidos envía a México, crecen los, los alimentos, se regresan a través del, de, la, de los alimentos, regresan aquí a Estados Unidos. Entonces, estas leyes, los, los agroquímicos no conocen las fronteras, es un negocio. Pues. Esta frontera es una mafia en el sistema alimenticio. I think the systems are working just the way they're supposed to, that borders are doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing, and it's causing separation, separating us from our power, from our food, from our magic, from our, you know, our families. Um, food brings us together and, um, and it makes us stronger. And so if you separate the people from their food, you separate them from their family, you separate them from their power, their magic, and it just goes on and on. You know, we start to question each other's identities or histories around these foods and who can claim them and who cannot. 
these um, relatives, these seeds, these beings, just like anything else, are meant to be claimed and be possessed, you know, they're meant to be shared. And that's how we're all still here today. ¿Cuál es la importancia de la preservación de las semillas nativas? No es nada más conservarlas por conservarlas y ya no por tener un banco de semillas, silos con, con semillas este, nativas y ya, sino tiene que ver con la conservación de las potencialidades que tiene cada uno de estas semillas. Esas semillas nativas son distintas. Por eso es importante rescatar el, el maíz, rescatar el sistema milpa y rescatar todo lo que se ha desprendido de, de los productos que se pueden hacer con el maíz a través de la cocina tradicional, ¿no? los alimentos tradicionales. Nadie va a llegar a... No, no hay un mesías que te diga, tienen que hacer esto, tienen que hacer lo otro y así se va a resolver esto. Y así se, no, ni un político, ni, ni un presidente, no. Lo único que va a resolver una situación social es la capacidad que tenga la sociedad de organizarse como sociedad, como colectivo. Sometimes we don't share these things as, we don't share these things in public, but I think that's where and why it's so important to develop relationships that create safe spaces for these teachings. Um, and especially now in the changing world, you want people to respect them and to um, really understand them, not extract them from communities and people, you know? So it's like, it, it gets all sensitive. And I think it's just another um, way to show how powerful this knowledge is. It's just, some people look at it, it's just food or just seeds. But again, you know, they're the reason why we're alive and we're here and we're healthy and, and they're still guiding us along our paths and different paths, but still, forward together. Uh, thanks for thanks for sharing that with us, Sewa, so, uh, for letting us preview that that trailer here. I'm really glad that, that we got to see that. It's really beautiful. Um, I'm excited to to see when the movie comes out and um, go ahead and jump into letting us know a little bit more about it. Yeah, yeah, I realized that like, uh, I was, it's a little like sensitive and emotional because the person who inspired me to make this, this film who really like ignited so much in me um, from things that I had already cultivated and learned and uh, experienced in my life um, passed away this last year in the summer so it's the first time I show it um and he was supposed to narrate it so Dr. Sneedley I just you know it's an honor of him and and just the love that I have and appreciation and you know I was talking to Glenda earlier like for me and like my story with food and with you know all the things that were shared in this in this video that I wanted to highlight from different voices and you know different people and cultures you know, is my story has, it wasn't always like, um, you know, it wasn't like a, this beautiful elaborate or like, you know, it's kind of a sad story, you know, of survival, you know, with, um, with food and, and so, but I've evolved, you know, with time, things have evolved and my relationship with food, my relationship with these stories and growing and learning, you know, about, you know, um, just my family, our lineage and the way we do things. And, um, so, this is kind of like a, a culmination of of so many different voices that um, like migration and, you know, immigration, like um, just our trade routes and how story just like how food and uh, brings us together. You know, it's always like the the center of everything, the centrifugal force and how it's brought so much healing and how powerful it is. And I just want people to get inspired. You know, some people don't have maybe their grandparents or or people in their lives, but they're still eating corn, they're still eating tortilla, and they're like, oh yeah, my tia makes this. I was like, yeah, well, that's that's your culture. That's like our food tells us so much about who we are, you know, because there's been so much, you know, disconnect and all the other things, right? Like that, that we've, that our people have endured. So yeah, this is um, a film is, is yeah, it's just really dedicated to, to a lot of um, people out there too, who want to feel inspired and 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 we connect with these these beautiful ways.
Ophelia, Ophelia Rosa said it's very emotional. It reminds, reminds me how my father cultivated the food when I was a child. Beautiful video. I feel connected. So I, th I think um, that's, that we were all feeling that when we saw that. That was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you guys, it was a little choppy. <laughs> it was really slow and choppy. But if people, if anybody out there wants to see, I reach out to me and I'll send you the link if, in case you kind of missed it a little bit. Yeah, thank you for letting me for you know letting allowing me to share that 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 like short little trailer or long little trailer. <laughs> and I know Glenda has um a, a presentation also a slideshow to share with us that's going to further this conversation and we'll then we'll be able to dig into to some other conversations. Yeah, so thank you, Sela. I the first time I saw that I was so I was so inspired. Um, and I really look forward to watching like the whole thing as it like comes together. So um, as Sewa mentioned, um, we met in all of these different places. So like in Hawaii, in Washington, in Mexico, like, um, and so a lot of my work, I feel like I has been this story of like travel and retracing migration stories. And so I just wanted to share a little bit about, about that uh, a little bit more in depth. Um, oh my gosh, now I can't find the button. Here we go. Um, so I'm just going to share the beginning here. My slideshow is not really working. All right. Um, so I do a lot of work more recently with uh, the Buffalo. So probably in the last 10 years, uh, bringing the Buffalo back to uh, different parts of the plains has been um, for four years, for sure. I, I feel like I talked about Buffalo every single day. <laughs> um, but because we were in this process of bringing Buffalo back to our sacred site, um, I also got to meet a lot of really beautiful like elders and knowledge keepers and not only like Western scientists, but also like indigenous scientists as well. And so I wanted to share, touch a little bit about um, this work with the Buffalo, um, which is um, now we know is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. But um, a lot of people aren't really aware of how far in, and the migrations of the Buffalo were pre, in pre-colonial times. So what you can see on this map is the buffalo extending almost to the eastern uh, seaboard, seaboard of the United States down into Mexico, all the way up along the mountain ranges um, into uh, parts of California there, Oregon, and the bottom of Washington State, and then all the way up to Saskatchewan and Alberta um, in the central plains there. Um, the, the northern piece is the wood bu buffalo migration paths. Um, and so we have the plains buffalo and the, and the wood buffalo. Um, and, you know, when I show this map, a lot of people don't really realize, but in, in 2000, and I think it was in 2011, we invited some folks from Mexico to come and share culture throughout the plains of, of Canada. And the first place that they wanted to go was actually to see the buffalo because they still had stories and, and remembered this grandfather that was a part of their, um, their traditions. And so um, I, I also thought that was really beautiful at the time. I, I, I didn't have the extent of how far the buffalo traveled. Um, and so what you see on this map are all of the dates and times of when the last buffalo was seen in that area. So you can see on the eastern side, 1795, that was the last time where people saw um, migrations of buffalo in that area. So 1760, 1720, and 1828 down there in the south in Texas. Um, and so what you can see, all of those numbers um, leading into that kind of middle section, that dark orange section, those numbers, 550, 10, 200, 26, 20, and 25, that's how many buffalo were left at the end of the extermination period. And normally when I talk about buffalo, I also talk about the fulfillment of prophecies. Um, so when uh, hundreds of years before Europeans came to our land, we, it was prophesized that we were going to lose the buffalo and at the same time we were going to lose our culture. And when that prophecy came about, our people did not even believe it. How can you believe that the 30 to 60 million buffalo were going to disappear? It was unfathomable. Um, and as we know, that's, that is our history. That is 
Um, we know that that happened. Um, but at the same time, it was a fulfillment of a prophecy. And so it's not like, um, you know, when I look at these numbers, I look at the apocalypse that has already happened. We have already experienced, lived through, survived um, an apocalypse as Indigenous people because they were the center of our existence. They were, they gave us a governance system. They're matriarchal in, in nature. And so um, I, just, I start here because now in my work, um, it's become really important to acknowledge so in 2008, I ran with Peace and Dignity Journeys and we ran through sacred sites. And a lot of those sites were basically gathering places and they were like trading spaces where people would trade from all over. So we had goods coming all the way up from South America and goods coming all the way from, from, from my area, way in the North. Um, and so I this has been, since that time, it just became such a huge part of my journey to travel and collect stories and understand these prophecies that I have carried in my heart for a really long time. But also, you know, when I was in Kickapoo territory, which is on the border of Texas, um, they were speaking my, my language. And I was like, how did that happen? How are these people that are like speak Spanish and Kickapoo speaking a, a language so similar to mine that I can understand what they're saying? Um, one of our knowledge keepers, who is the keeper of our star knowledge, his name is Wilfred Buck. Um, in 2016, I was sitting at in one of his book launches for his star book that he released, and he talked about um, Opaswat Cree Nation, which is a really, really northern community, in 1968 was digging basements, and they found a 25-year-old burial chamber of a woman wrapped in ceremonial wear with a cedar cloak, an addle addle with a stone head from the Great Lakes, shells from the Gulf of Mexico, and ochre from South Dakota. And um, so that was like 25 years ago. So these elaborate trade route systems are part of, I guess, our story of rematriation. And this idea of rematriation, um, so we do, we talk about rematriation and like seeds and and I've heard it like with food and I, and we work on this with the buffalo. But this idea of rematriation is actually a reclamation of returning to our ancestral ways, knowledge, creation stories, original teachings, and, and how we utilize these things to be in a good relationship with Mother Earth, right? So that's basically what rematriation is. It's like, for me, my birth work story centers around my understanding of how I understand I'm connected to Mother Earth. And from that story, all of the teachings make sense. Um, I wanted to talk about this because when we start thinking about origin and migration stories and like, you know, why are the Kickapoo speaking my language? Uh, one of my sisters is is actually studying the Cree language and the verbs and the uh, and the and the verb structure of Cree. Um, and through that work, she um, identified all of these language connections to the very beginning. So, like when we're talking about a creation story, we're talking about thousands of years, um, millions of years, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years um, of this uh, origin story, this creation story of where we were lowered, you know, from the star realm and brought into a physical way. So when we're thinking about um, reconnecting kinship systems, if you go to the languages, you begin to understand how old these stories are and you begin to see and understand the evolution of us as, let's say, Plains Cree people or Kickapoo or Meskwaki and Penobscot. <laughs> but in the time before time, but in the time in pre-colonial times, we were able to maintain these trade routes because these are all um, connected languages. And so that means that we all originated from the same language source. Um, in my work with birth, uh, I have adopted a model of apprenticeship. Um, and so I think when I first started my work, I was doing these like workshops and I would go to a community and do workshops and then leave. Um, but as we know, the this knowledge is um, when we put food at the center of a community, there is all of these other knowledges that kind of like come with it and they build on each other. Um, and so we started this apprenticeship program called the Rematriation Apprenticeship, where we focus on kinship and healing together. And that being first and foremost, because as Sewa talked about, 
we are all in different stages of healing, healing from the apocalypse that happened to many of our people. Um, there are ceremonial or cyclical in basis. So all of our gatherings have a different connection to um, the seasons or cosmology. Um, they include uh, aspects of plant medicine and healing on the land and really like understanding what it means to rebuild family medicine bundles. A lot of people have lost that knowledge because the lineages have been broken up. And then probably the most important piece is this idea of ancestral foods and nourishment. Um, you know, 80% of our culture <laughs> historically was centered around food. Who is growing the food, how it was being gathered, who is doing the work and how the resources were distributed in the community. That was our culture. Um, and today our culture camps have food up on the side. It's like a side piece. <laughs> Whereas I really want to see food at the center again and culture being built up around it. And uh, I think a lot of food people know that our ancestral foods are nutrient dense. Um, and so, you know, in our communities, we actually have a lot of uh, people that might have access to food, but the quality of food is creating um, situations of malnutrition. So we might have uh, an abundance of these commodity foods like macaroni and and really, really like um, uh, uh, simple carbohydrates, but they're actually not providing the nutrition that we need, the proteins that build strong, healthy skin, um, that don't spike our sugars. Um, our bodies were designed to be to run far distances, to be active every day, to be to have at least a couple hours of of active energy to work, to get, gather, grow, um, fish, hunt, <laughs> build, all of those things. Our bodies have evolved in that way for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And so just in the last, you know, hundred years, we're really struggling because our body hasn't had the time to like, to, to adapt. Um, and so for me, my work with birth work has centered around this idea that in, in, in utero, we have <clears throat> creation laws, we have laws of like child rearing laws. And so through this apprenticeship, we begin to understand what our responsibility is to the next generation. And the one time that we can actually have an impact on healing multiple generations is during that time of uh, that someone is with child. During that time, how much a person eats, sleeps, exercises, all of those things can turn off and turn on different genes in our body that are going to set that child up for the rest of not only their lives, and especially when we, like my granddaughter was born in April of 2020. So my granddaughter, um, when she was in utero, everything that we did to make her mom feel loved is like in her brain <laughs> and you can see the impact of of what that kind of what she becomes this confident loving um beautiful she's so beautiful I, I love my granddaughter so much um but you can actually really see the impact that because she's also carrying the seeds of her mother and her and her grandmother and and also my genes as well. So she's carrying multiple generations of knowledge and genes that can be transformed during what is that like we we say 13 months. We say there that there's some months before baby is born and some months after that make up the whole prenatal period. Um, and so how we mm -hmm. develop a child's um, taste buds, how we wire their brain how we awaken their ancestral genes is what we're feeding to them in utero. Um, I feel like a lot mm -hmm. of times we have colonized palates because we are not eating, drinking, um, feeding our mothers the foods that our ancestors have eaten for a really, really long time. And when we do that, um, we see that those are the kids that are, pick up the traditions a lot, a lot easier. So I think I'm like talking more than I thought I would. I, I don't think I want to go over how ancestral food can be prevention. I think we, I've kind of like touched on that, um, that this idea of 13 moons of uh, postpartum nutrition, I know that Sewa does a lot of this kind of work and I don't know if she wants to talk a little bit about it. I've kind of talked about uh, my uh, bit um, 
uh, my knowledge around uh, what do we feed to prenatal, postpartum, and also breastfeeding traditions all came out of conversations with knowledge keepers, just asking what were the foods and plant medicines that we gave to pregnant and nursing moms. And, um, and from that, uh, we teach about how to prepare these foods. Um, and what was interesting when I asked that question, the answers that I was getting, and as you kind of do your own research, a lot of the foods were things that people said, don't give prenatal moms this. And I'm like, well, if we have like hundreds or thousands of generations of people that were eating this type of food, what is it that changed? Um, and mm -hmm. so that's been an interesting journey as well. Do you have something you want to add, Sewa? Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just really excited. Um, just thank you so much for just all the knowledge that you just shared right now. I'm really excited because it, yeah, it just activates me and, um, you know, speaking on, on the food, that food part. And that's really what got me, got me, um, on my path, you know, I shared a little bit earlier, um, like how food kind of called me is like it, it certain foods that my, my nanas, my grandmas would feed me that led me to where I'm at now. And I know that's why it's so powerful. Why I emphasize so much on not just postpartum, but prenatal, you know, sometimes they kind of, there's like a wave of like, it's really popular postpartum care, but also like, you know, we can prevent so much with just the food, you know, we can different out, birth outcomes, right? Like, ch like challenges, like with, you know, gestational diabetes, soldier dystocia, like things like that, that could be prevented by our traditional foods, ancestral foods, because like you said, they're like so nutrient dense, but there's also like the, the spiritual aspect, right? The spiritual aspect of it that oftentimes that um, we don't talk about, because um, to me, that's that's the part that helps me, you know, remember who I am and like those those corn creation stories, you know, that that corn creation story that Dr. Simply shared with me is what really um, kind of inspired me to go a lot deeper into into our food and, you know, and to go to the root of everything, you know, it's like, wow, like if these if these sacred packs that we had, you know, with 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 these seeds, you know, and that they're like, you know, have all this genetic memory and that help us like have a symbiotic relationship, right? With nature. Um, now we're eating all this like genetic genetically modified corn and all this other, you know, like sugar and and all the things that really like change our genetics. They change us, they it, like disconnects us. Like it's really like amnesia, you know, like really like um, in Spanish, we say, Te borran el tape. <laughs> but they're like, really like, you know, just changing us and, and uh, we we're we're forgetting, you know, and so that's why, like, for me, like, this serving a mother, some matole, which is a corn drink, um, and the way it's prepared, the intention behind it, and having an, like, the, the connection and the, um, you know, relationship to that home fire, all of that matters. It, it sets the tone for that baby for, and for that mother and for their bonding time. And, and it is very sacred, you know, all the, and, you, and I don't want to speak for all indigenous people, you know, because different people feed their, you know, freshly postpartum, you know, person, like a certain type of food. But for me, it's been like this corn drink. And even if it's just that corn drink that they get to take that is to activate that mom and that baby and to help them remember. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know my video was off. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I love the corn, I love the corn drink. And um, a lot of our like postpartum traditions are connected to our creation story around like mother earth. But like one of the, one of the elements of that is like, and, and I see this in a lot of traditions. So I don't know, um, why or how or whatever but like um, we call it like bringing warmth back into the womb and, mm -hmm. um, and so like all of the all of the foods and the things that we do are actually like that's the closing do you know what I mean is like allowing a mother's like womb to maintain her fire and so a lot of the foods that we do and how we prepare it have fire as an element in 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 its design which is um, a really powerful powerful teaching yeah. too. I, I love that. I love that. Um, all the, just all the different types of foods and elements that, you know, we the similarities of like keeping you know the postpartum person like warm, you know that that fourth trimester, you know, it's just like so crucial. All these different things that and 
yeah thank you for sharing that because it's it's all the pictures and how you elaborated was really awesome um i think one thing that we can all agree on and i see this all over now um when i was a kid growing up bone marrow was a part it was like our butter <laughs> it was like our margarine <laughs> Um, and uh, bone marrow, why it's such a powerful tool, not only for, so I like in our tradition, how we feed and how we take care of prenatal moms and postpartum moms is the same way that we would take care of elders and um, people who are in their, in moving towards their transition, because in, as we know, like in our blood and in our bones, it holds all of our DNA it, whole, it is like the health and wellness. If we cut open our bones, we would be able to see just how healthy we are. <laughs> um, and obviously we can't do that. But in that bone marrow are the same fats, the same benefits of drinking breast milk. Because breast milk actually pulls from the bones to create that nourishing, uh, those nourishing waters for the baby. Um, and so because, you know, afterwards, the mom has given so much of her bones of her body, bone uh, broths and bone marrow and bone and all of the fats that are contained in the bone marrow are one of the most important things that we can give back to a mom um, up to 13 months postpartum as she's replenishing her body and throughout the entire journey of her breastfeeding experience. In our tradition, people breastfed for, you know, years, not months, but years. Uh, we would have uh, babies, you know, hanging off of us. And I know in my family, I didn't even know that it was an, an option that I could bottle feed a baby <laughs> because I had seen these traditions where I nursed off my auntie's, uh, I, I nursed off my auntie's breasts. I nursed for a really long time. I was one of those babies that you had to like drag off of your body. <laughs> um, but the this idea of bone marrow, um, as well as like some of the other parts of, um, of like small game animals, like the liver, the heart, the kidneys, these are all definitely um, parts and pieces that we, uh, that we will feed to our prenatal and postpartum moms, as well as um, elders, because elders bones get more and more brittle, brittle as they age, but also we feed them these organ meats because as we know, as we age, the organs start to decline. And so we, mm -hmm. we feed them these things that, um, that, that they're missing or that they've given um, of themselves. Um, our baby food, and I wish everyone could stop feeding your babies like pablum or whatever else is out there because these are, grown in places where there's like really, really high rates of like heavy metals and different things. Um, but our first baby food was, uh, was like meat broth and wild rice or meat broth, wild rice and some kind of winter squash. And so we would mix all this up and we would overcook the rice so that it was like literally bursting and, and mush. And we would crush that all down. And that was baby's first foods. Um, but we also know that our a lot of our carb carbohydrates that we have in our ancestral foods um, will also have like high amounts of fiber, and so that fiber working with the um, working with basically the carbohydrates slows that process down so that we don't have those massive spikes of sugar um, if we were just to eat regular rice or other types of carbohydrates. So just wanted to mm -hmm. share that a little bit. Um, and then finally, I guess just, I wanted to like, oops, talk about um, our first foods. And when I talk about decolonizing diet, um, I also talk about decolonizing our palates because today when I talk about our, our food system, people get so grossed out. <laughs> they get so grossed out by eating tripe and moose nose and, and all these other things that, that were like part of our everyday, um, you know, the whole fish head, like all the things. But so at the time of birth, the midwife would take a piece of an animal intestine, dip this in maple syrup, which the newborn baby would suckle. The maple syrup would ha help to clean out the baby's stomach. And then food in the form of soup was introduced to the baby anywhere around six to eight months and gradually other foods such as meat. And we would also take that meat and we would chew it. 
and we would chew it until it was like almost disintegrated. So like all of our saliva and basically all of the, the um, it was like a way that we would introduce our um, saliva to improve the immune system of our children. So we would chew up this meat and we would give it to them kind of like how the birds do it. <laughs> we watched the birds and learned that from them. Um, and then elders um, advised us to feed our babies as our first foods, kind of uh, teaspoons of wild meat so that they would develop their taste buds to uh, salivate actually. Cause every time I smell moose tripe being cooked, my mouth salivates and people don't have that reaction. <laughs> and I feel like <laughs> because, <laughs> because that was like what my dad cooked for us, that, that was like our traditional food that was, you know, um, part of my DNA being activated. Um, and I also just wanted to give a shout out to my sisters in the Indigenous Birth Justice Network. So we have Spokane Tribal Network, we have the Urban Salish Heath Mahip, um, we have I can never say their name, but the Macaw Birth Justice Collective, the Colville Tribe, we have the Alaska Birth Workers Community, and all of these sisters have included traditional foods and ancestral knowledge in, in the work that they're doing to bring birth back and kinship systems and um, all of this like good stuff that is um, happening in our network. So I just wanted to give a, a quick shout out to them as well. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing so we can um I'm sorry I'm um sorry mariah um clayton sent a note from someone who's trying to log in i'm wondering if you could send um send them a link and i um there's there's a few comments um that clayton made that i think it only went out to the hosts and the panelists so i wanted to to um put um put those out there that um when you were talking about the language the Kikapu language and the Cree language being connected. And he talked about Art Solomon Ojibwe could also understand the Kikapu. And I love how you um, wove us all together through that language. And even the Mi'kmaq, the, the Penobscot and Passamaquoddy here. Um, and, and we have stories. We have these stories of how our relatives went west. Um, because, of, because of these stories that were foretold that, um, that we knew were gonna happen, things um, with the buffalo, um, with with our ceremonies, with our language, with with all of those things, and um, and we we know that you know our relatives out east are, are holders of a lot of those things. And so when I when I look at languages, I am looking with that respect too. That the knowing that there there's so much encoded from our first teachers, right? Our animal, the animals, mm -hmm. um, and nature are our first teachers, and that's where our language sprung from. And so anywhere in the world um, where, you know, when our languages, have, they have those teachings. And so I know like when um, I hear that, um, you know, that Kickapoo down there um, and being Buffalo people like that too, that's, um, that's really amazing. And, and Clayton also said Corn's one of our original mothers. Um, and people are um, talking about how, um, how this is really moving them, this, um, this idea of kinship. Um, and um, epigenetics, how the, you know, these babies are in utero experiencing um, things that are connecting them genetically to long, long lines of how we developed as people. Um, and, and, and I love the story that you have about the, the um, moose tripe. And I would, I'd love to hear how you prepare moose tripe too. I mean, that's, that's something Me I'm interested too. in is hearing, hearing um, a few of the, the recipes that you have and hearing a few of that was recipes um, uh, and also so that we could ignite that in our own cooking pots. Maybe things that we're not as familiar with too. Um, I know like I've, you know, I've been able to go in and gut a moose, but I'm not super familiar with cooking all of the parts of it. And we've had a conversation before Glenda about, about how a lot of the muscle meats would get thrown to the dogs and it was the intestines and the organs and the fat that were really valuable nutrients. And I, I feel like a lot of the, this idea of like a bone marrow fat and um, plant uh, or um, animal organs are getting lost in a lot of the noise um, and conversations that are happening about, um, about uh, nutrition. And I, I love like moving back to, to these really solid ideas of what our first foods were. Um, 
So yeah, just um, just putting that out there and and wanting to hear from um, Sewa some of your thoughts too. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I was thinking about uh, one of the last uh, uh, projects that uh, Dr. Sinkley uh, wanted to do, and he had this. It was a really beautiful ambitious project in a good way you know um he wanted to catalog all the corn stories all the corn creation stories and he's like you know we're gonna figure it out Let's talk to different people and just catalog it all and um i had came to him a few years back and wanting to do that with birth stories birthing stories and 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 then we 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 both kind of like well what we emerged and cataloged all the different like corn creation stories you know and some people there's other foods right other creation stories around food, uh, but particularly with corn and with birth. And I love the idea of, you know, like, you know, you had this, all the buffalo, like, you know, you had all the dates and that's really beautiful. Um, I'd like to ask like the audience and the people there, you know, like something you would, I don't know, like how, you know, revitalizing these old trade routes and like, what would people want to see? Like, what are the the foods and like the stories or things? Because it's just not foods, but it's also stories and remedies and, and ways because those things have been passed down for many generations to different cultures, different tribes, all through Abiyayala. You know, there's, there, they, there's a, they just, this scientist, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't want to say this is a fact, but they found the corn that was actually older than the corn that they found, the oldest corn in Mexico, in, that is in Guerrero. They found one in Peru that's like a lot older. So this is, it's really interesting because we're like, wow, like they were trading seeds and seeds were somehow making their ways over there and, and languages and stories. So I think it's really beautiful because that's also another a form of us like healing too, like all of the, the like, the genocide and all the things that were like taken away from us that you were talking about, uh, Glenda. So yeah, it's just, it's really beautiful. And it's something that I want to see. And I do want to, I want to fulfill that for Dr. Sintley and, and be able to catalog and connect with other people that want to catalog all these stories from different, all the, from all the way Chile to, to Canada, Alaska, you know, mm -hmm. and I know it's, it'll take a while, but I think it's really beautiful because then we get to see like how much, you know, we are alike and how much we really need each other, you know, and how we can heal and like just fight this big monster that we're all fighting, you know, like that's really like oppressing us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I feel like, you know, this work is probably more important now than ever before. You know, I, I, through the work of like peace and dignity and like retracing these migration um, stories, as well as like, you know, ending up in Clayton's <laughs> program down there and, and all of these different places. Um, you know, my granddaughter was born in April of 2020. So like right at the beginning of the pandemic and her story mm -hmm. is like one of climate change because I was living on the West coast and numerous times I got stopped because of these massive heat. I don't know what they call them, but they came up with some kind of like heat storm where it's just such intense heat that like it it like leveled a, a, a an entire town in like two hours and burnt it to the ground. Um, another time in Vancouver, we were completely um, we couldn't go south to Seattle. We couldn't go east, northwest. We couldn't go anywhere because we were flooded in because an ancient lake that had been basically all the water had been taken from it so that they could start farming there um, had reclaimed itself <laughs> in this in this flood and and I was like well that's kind of like karma <laughs> um, but at the same time um, you know her story and my story uh, our lifetime her lifetime is spent in a time of climate change and so these migrations and trading seeds and and so they say that my climate in Saskatchewan will become more like Texas. So we need to start saving the seeds that are from Texas to be able to grow in, in our area so that we could adapt and adopt so that my daughter, my granddaughter is still going to be able to, to have food during climate change. So these ideas of like, yes, we're, we're in this process of reclaiming, but we also need to remember that these ancestral pathways, migrations were put in place. And that was what kept us strong as like indigenous or Nahio people. Um, and so this work, we need to talk more, we need to share more, we need to understand more about how and what and how are we going to plan for seven generations of climate change? Mm -hmm. What do we do today? 
right? So, yeah, I feel like we're doing that with, um, yes, Clayton. <laughs> um, was birth at home? Oh, that's so beautiful. Yay. <laughs> um, yeah, and my my granddaughter was was born in a hospital. Um, and, uh, and that was also a really hard kind of experience, but it also like reinforced the importance of bringing this birth back home, providing the foods, doing the proper closing, um, all of those things that need to happen, you know, post birth. And, and a lot of them center around our food and our medicines. Mm -hmm. That got me thinking a lot about like, you know, kinship and within the, the, the birth world and network, like the importance of having all the, it wasn't everything all just on the midwife. It was a communal thing and everybody brought something to the table, right. To, to make all of that happen and to, to, <clears throat> yeah, to help like support these people. So I was also thinking about um, Nicole's uh, project that she had a while back. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit on Locas because that reminded me a lot of you know what you guys wanted to do and um i think it'll be really inspirational to the people who are listening right now that want to do this work on you know revitalizing these trade routes or like connecting and how you guys did all that work yeah we um it was uh after gosh i don't remember how many years ago it was but we were at um the indigenous design course with clayton um with uh, TNAFA, and it was uh, me, um, Nelda uh, Rodriguez, and Nicole Yanis, and um, inspired from that. And, and um, Nicole didn't attend that group, but inspired from that, the three of us got together and decided to um, start um, a tianguis or a market. Um, and it was it was um, started in backyards. So like in backyards of friends and family um, and neighborhoods so that we were um, able to create it without a lot of oversight, you know, so we could um, uh, with with the help of, uh, you know, um, my uh, credit card, I just bought a whole bunch of bulk food from different tribes. So I got wild rice um, from Red Lake Nation and I um, was able to get some um, maple sugar um, from some of the um, the food sovereignty um, conferences that we went up to in the Great Lakes, um, and um, just getting food like that. And then getting we were I was in Tucson at the time, Tucson, Arizona. So we were we were running it out of there, and we were finding small producers, um, larger producers that were all in indigenous and. Um, bringing their food in and being able to sell it at cost so that we could bring um, that knowledge and those trade routes to so start reigniting them and starting those conversations and bringing in um, local people to have a teach-in or a skill sharing. We would bring um, bike mechanics in to teach about um, fixing up a bike. We brought um, some uh, native chefs in to teach about things. And it was all for um, indigenous and POC folks to come together and feel that safety. And we got a resounding yes, like thank you for these things because it was a place where people could come and safely um, reimagine their connection to these trade routes, and the, trade routes and these foods without feeling embarrassed that they didn't know about them. Um, and I, and I, I know personally I've come from that space like I mean that like all the teachings and, and things that I'm learning um and all the connections that I make are because I'm relearning all those things myself but sometimes that's a, that's a hard thing when we go into spaces where someone that's not native might know about that thing that we feel like we're supposed to know about and so people were like thanks like I learned about my food today and I was able to do it with someone that I felt comfortable with somebody um that um is from my community and that they were able to share that in a space that did feel safe like that. So we were creating that reconnection with trade routes, not just through the, the food, but also through the, through the teachings and bringing people together and people's parents would come and make food and they would share food. So we were having home cooked food coming in. Um, and from that also grew um, butchering of um, goats. And we were able to bring urban youth together to um, come together and talk about 
you know, the, where, where is our food coming from, even in these urban areas. So we're able to um, affect change that now is reverberating in that uh, Tucson community um, in a, a farm that's right in the city. And they're every year they're, they're raising goats there now. And every year they're, they're doing that same um, goat harvest and using that to teach about foods through that. So it's, it was a really great project and it catapulted all of us in different directions now, but it, it was a really great birthing of, of our way of recognizing, honoring, and trying to bring discussion around trade routes um, and how we could, could do our part with that. And it felt really good because it was a learning for all of us and, and connecting us with producers out there that that are doing that for their families um, on large and small scales and trying to share those those foods. Thank you for sharing that. I was, um, yeah, I used to get my my cornmeal from, from Nikki and then my cacao too. And that's what I would use for, you know, my postpartum care. So I thought, you know, it was really important to share that because <clears throat> that's that's really like where I got a lot of inspiration too. When I saw like these three women, I'm like, wow, this is amazing, you know, like, uh, the whole the idea and 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 bringing in community together and I saw the community bring in together coming together and learning and yeah you're right we did kind of all go our ways but it's still we're still um yeah we're just still connected through all these like food ways which is pretty awesome yeah and so what so what you started out coming to those selling bone broth to community like getting mm -hmm. getting that really essential knowledge out there of of bone broth and what that means and for a lot of people they're like whoa what is you know what is this and you were able to have those discussions with people you were bringing those ideas out there and that's that's what the beautiful thing is is we're able to bring all our different knowledge together to incite you know people to be like oh what is this and and get into that and I I remember being so excited to to have some of your bone broth at that at those gatherings and know that I could. Um, that I could purchase it through you. Mm -hmm. That was fun. I, I called it bone broth in harmony. <laughs> was, uh, and I still make my bone broth now. People, people will still, you know, contact me for some bone broth, which is great. Mm -hmm. And I saw that that bone marrow made me really hungry. <laughs> I know, didn't it? Doesn't it look so good? <laughs> yeah. So good. I just wanted to like get scoop it out <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally can't isn't that like the visual that you get though is like how you can just like scoop it out and it's like butter um mm -hmm. so literally yes. gold <laughs> better than yeah gold. there there is um there's a lot of people that that talk about um in Mikamagi about bone about bone butter I was like bone butter bone butter and then I realized oh it's it's that marrow because yeah, it is it is like butter and you put some salt with that and it's just it has so much flavor and um it, sometimes when I can't get a lot of um fat other ways I'll use that marrow and and bake it and use that so that I have uh, marrow fat to cook with um and that's a really um you know it's it's an easier way sometimes of getting of getting some of the fat of animals if you can't go in and um, be part of a butchering process to get some of the fat from the organs you can purchase bone marrow um, and and cook that and have um, fat for for cooking. Um, so that yeah, it was it was really good to see that too. I, I also wanted to just note the time that it is about um, seven after the hour, and that if anyone has any questions that they want to put in, um, they're welcome to um, put those in the chat. Um, or in the Q and A, and and we'll keep our eye on that. And um, I know that I did have I had a question. I don't see anything else popping right now, but mine was a little bit more about um, the apprenticeship mm -hmm. that you were talking about, Glenda. Um, and um, I wanted to know I if, if it was something that people signed up for. Or was it was in a specific community that you were doing that. Yeah, so about, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, I just kind of like posted on Facebook. And um, like, when I think of apprenticeship, it's not like 20 people that like pop in and out. It's more like uh, people who are ready to do legacy or lineage work. And so because a lot of it is like rebuilding kind of like a family bundle, maybe it was like knowledge that 
your mom didn't carry, your grandma didn't carry because they went to residential schools or boarding schools, or maybe they were adopted out, or maybe they just don't have the story anymore. Um, I, I feel like the apprenticeship was an opportunity for people to like really begin to like dig deep into that legacy work and that lineage work and like uh, connect with birth traditions, food traditions and in different ways. Um, but uh, so that was like a year and a half ago. I feel like with our Indigenous Birth Justice Network, I just happened to be um, in my in my work capacity, be able to like provide mentorship to the communities that are are mentioned there and uh, be able to provide workshops and different like ways of supporting them. And so that's been a big part of my job now. Um, but that apprenticeship will start again in about six months. So there'll be a, like another call out for people who are interested in joining. Okay, so people can just follow you on Facebook to see yeah, sure. when just, you put that no, out there. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay. And um, Sewa, My, um, what, I, wanted, I, I wanted to join class. <laughs> what? I said I want to join that class. <laughs> okay. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Um, Sewa, did you see the question in the chat about um, traditional parteras in um, the Tucson area? Um, there's a, a um, Alexis Tapia um, is a birth and postpartum doula, and they'd love to find a teacher who'd be open to teaching about ancestral practices with birth. Do you have any recommendations oh. or thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not a midwife. Um, I was a student midwife. I am a, a traditional birth keeper. Um, I am more than happy to share it. If you're in the Tucson area, I'd love to. Um, I'm in the works right now of formulating something, a workshop or gathering here, in-person gathering here in Tucson with um, people who want to learn traditional, um, just like just re recipes cooking, but also like uh, like working with herbs and um, what else? Um, body work. So yeah, please. I don't know um, a place like a resource where it has all condensed of everybody doing, but if you message me, uh, we could talk more about it. Yeah. Yeah, um, there was a question. I also am not a midwife. I, I feel like I was moving in that direction. And then um, I feel like there was like, so so to me, Indigenous midwifery is not the time of birth and developing all of the skills for that. I feel like there was like this legacy and lineage work, which ended up being the rematriation apprenticeship, <laughs> um, where I've realized that there is a lot of other teachings that are all encompassing from birth to to, to death and understanding all of the ways that we as like Nehiao people, but also as like families, there's so much restoration that needs to happen that I feel like maybe that, that maybe it will be, maybe it won't be, but right now I feel like it will definitely be my granddaughter's journey because she is growing up with every ceremony, every prayer, every opportunity. She's had all of her rites of passage up until this point done for her as well as her mom has also received a closing that has been absent from our story for a really long time so if you know my role or my responsibility in this job is just to make sure that i'm creating a community of of sisters and aunties and grandmas that are are holding those teachings so that even after i'm gone my granddaughter is going to have all of these people who are going to be able to support her in her work as a midwife so you know like when we think about legacy or, or lineage work, we really like have to assess like what we have to give, right? And and what is our role? So maybe it will be a midwife one day, but right now it's it it, it isn't there. It's been teaching and educating and creating spaces. So could you both drop your um the best way to to find you um. If it's uh, Facebook or if you have um, emails that you prefer to be contacted by, people are asking how they can keep in contact with you. And also, um, Lucy, you asked about the video. It is going to be um, uploaded on um, the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance um, website. They have a YouTube channel and it, and it will be on there so it can be rewatched. Um, and that way, um, Glenda just put in their, um, oh, that's, is that just going to the hosts and the panelists? Yeah, oh, I, I think 
Yeah, oh. there's, I don't have an option to share with everyone. I only can share with, with hosts and panelists as well. So maybe, Mariah, you could copy and paste that in so everyone can see that um, information. Um, and, if, and if you um, say, well, what's the best way to contact you to find out about your work? And Yeah, I just I just posted it. So you can get contact uh, you me directly to me in your email. <laughs> But um, there's like a little drop down button to send chat to everyone. Oh, is it? Yeah. It doesn't let it's me. It only option. no. It, it only let lets me. me do it to the panelist members and the host. I got y'all. Same. <laughs> and someone is raising their hand. I think people are. I can allow to talk to. Um, sure. Oh yeah, great. So, yeah. yeah if you would like to ask your question. Yeah, hi. Um Ani Buju, Dibika Nakokwe, and Adishna Coast, Benisi and Dodum, Minze Bikadum Donjuba, and Ashave Kwandas. Um my English name's Kayla. I just wanted to uh just share a couple of resources with people because I see people in the chat seem interested and I've participated in a few different um classes, courses like uh Ram Madison's postpartum healing lodge. Um and she shares a lot of different recipes and things in her training. She has a recipe book. Um, she does work with uh, the Center for Indigenous Midwifery. And I'm actually taking their childbirth education right now. Um, and then there's this always all kinds of continued education opportunities between those two people. And then there's just a lot of other work being done, I feel like, all across the country. I know um, I also took a course with birth workers of color out of Long Beach, California during the pandemic, they like went virtual and now they still do offer virtual things. And that has just a whole collective of different uh, people of color that do this work, do birth work and things and offer the same. I mean, it's all kinds of things just from recipes to traditions of all people from all different kinds of tribes. And yeah, so there's a lot happening out there and I can't see the participants in this. I, don't, I have no idea who's on here. I just seen it on Facebook and someone someone in another course I was taking mentioned this. So I wanted to just check out this, this uh, gathering to see, you know, what was being talked about here. Just I, I don't know. I just like, I like learning more from different people. Right. So there's a lot happening out there. I don't know if anyone is into any of those things, or maybe there's even people on here that are, that've seen me in other places too, or, or in some of these trainings with me. Cause again, I can't see who's on here, but that's all. I just wanted to share. There's a lot happening and, and thank you all for sharing your knowledge and, and the resources that you all have too. It's it's just good to know that there's lots of people out here that care about this work, care about birthing people. That's all. Miigwech, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we should and I don't I don't know if anyone's already done this, like cataloged like all the resources, like I know that uh, my sister, Tema Mercado, uh, in San Diego, she's a partera midwife um, teacher. She does have a, a list of resources for uh, in just California, but I mean, it looks like we might need something for like, you know, just spread across the country and in Canada too, <clears throat> of just uh, different indigenous birth workers and teachers and resources like, that's something that would be super wonderful to see. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm seeing that someone's asking Kayla, if you have an opportunity to put those resources in the chat, they didn't hear the first name. Somebody is, um... oh, Kayla. Okay, Kayla put it in there. All right, thank you so much. And it's um, Rianne Madison Postpartum Healing Lodge. Yeah, she's awesome. Oh, I see Phoebe on here, our sister Phoebe. She's a student midwife out in uh, San Diego, um, which is, you know, just kind of what you were sharing about your your path, um, you know, Glenda. And like, you know, I thought me too, like, oh, okay, this is the end. This is like, if this was like a, a line, a straight line to get to the end point, I'm like, okay, that's midwifery. That's mm -hmm. where I need to go. Like, because all the things and, I, I got really humbled along the way and also like just gained wisdom and, you know, had, you know, even moments of, I don't know, just like all the things, right, that you learn in birth. And it's not always 
pretty and, and it's sometimes there are growing pains and um, trying to learn what my role is, you know, that was really important. And with all of this, with a, what we've said and shared earlier, like, I feel like it's been really even something so simple of, of like these of recipes, like something sharing the recipes, like I almost every day people ask me I'm like well like not a lot of people have the researchers or parents that shared like these recipes and what they mean like the herbs like epazote and different things that get put and why it's in there and it's connected to to our growth and like like you said in utero like everything happens there and there's different roles that we play in a it's like we've been so colonized to believe like okay I have to get my license to get to this point but you know, I, I really admire the work that you do, Glenda. It's really inspiring and and how you've put it together. And it sets the the path for all the other people who may be really into, you know, birth work. And, you know, maybe it's like too far-fetched or difficult or challenging, or maybe don't want to go through the path of getting, being a licensed midwife. But there's all these other, other roles that are so important. This is the important. This is about when we talk about rematriation and rematriating in like our birth ways. This is it planting corn. Like that was a simple to me. The message was always very simple to me. Okay, you want to learn something so well? Like spirit is telling me, go plant corn. You know, you have all these, there's all these people doing different things and ceremonies. And, but like when you plant corn, your milpa, it'll share so much with you and you it'll even sh share with you like about birth work and what you're doing and your role and and it's it's pretty magical so I just wanted to share that and just say thank you oh no I just wanted to say thank you too I, I feel like we have like mutual love and respect for each other because I just look at everything that you're doing and all of the postpartum work and all of the things um I've always admired uh the work and how you do it and how you bring that food and you can really see your ancestors like shining through in all of that work and how you're putting those magic hands and, and, and coming up with all of the recipes and all of the food. Um, oh, there was something I was going to say, but I forgot. That's okay. It probably wasn't important. <laughs> It'll come back. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I there... just want to um, uh, kind of uh, look back on the thread that I feel like you both were weaving together and that's that genetic memory um and what when we work with birthing people in these different ways it's not it's not just during that um birthing process or during the postpartum it's working with youth so that as they go into these times when they might choose to birth that they have this knowledge already so bringing it back and so that it's really invaluable information like knowing that that we can start working on the the taste buds the palate of of young people of babies now so that their children um like you were both talking about like those that generational knowledge those those things that come up for us when we smell certain foods when we taste certain foods that are being activated um, from generations ago, um, there might have been blocks and and when we've had those foods, but our our bodies are recognizing are recognizing those. So thank you for that for that thread. And um, we are ending it pretty soon here. It's four twenty one. So Mariah, I was hoping you could look into the participants that are here and pull a person name out of the hat so that we could send you something from Clayton. Um, and you can put that in the chat um, and um, we'll get that information to, to you, Clayton, um, so we can get your um, address and, and everything. Uh, and I just wanted to put it out there if there's any other final questions um, that anyone has, um, Clayton, invite you into the conversation if you had any, any questions or anything you wanted to say. I, I I really don't have any questions. I just want to thank everybody for uh, willing to share um, the information uh, this afternoon, and the people that are uh, listening in. the um, The series, virtual series that we started, there's um, it's called Restoring 
help for a healthy future. And what was talked about today is really um, looking at, um, you know, the future of our, of our families, of our, uh, of our communities, you know, um, bringing our children and our grandchildren into this world in the, in a, in a manner that um, has been done in our communities for, uh, for a very, very long time since the beginning. And, um, you know, you know, take, taking um, that information and putting it back into practice is, uh, um, is inspiring to me. You know, um, that's what we wanted for um, our children. Um, and now we're seeing it with our grand our grandkids and our great grandchildren. Thank you. Yeah, I just I love Clayton and his wife sitting back there. <laughs> two, two of my favorite people um, and being invited into their home. I don't celebrate Christmas, so I ended up a few times being celebrating Christmas in 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 their pueblo, um, watching their dances and eating all their beautiful food. Um, so thank you for inviting me into your space and into your home. And um, I, I always hold you guys as like an inspiration as to like how we re rebuild kinship systems and. And um, and I'm always inspired by your story and um, and the way that you guys have held your family together. So thank you guys for that important generational healing work that you guys have done um, as well. Um, I, Ophelia, I see your um, email there and I'll contact you um, and um, plug you and Clayton and I together so that we can um, get that package out to you. Okay. Thank you. I want to uplift the um, Kayla um, shared the Indigenous Doulas Facebook page with Zagidi one. one. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, but they're amazing, uh, amazing group of women, and um, and I just love seeing how you know we're all connected to one another too. You know, it kind of seems like you know we live in silos and we're doing things on like on the webinar like this but you know we're all we're all connected and I'm just happy to know that you know these are good people and just want to thank you Glenda and Sewa so much for for being on here and for Nicole and Clayton it's been really great doing these webinars with you all and just a hat thanks guys. yes yes thank you everyone and and thank you Sewa and Glenda for your time and sharing that today with us and having a conversation with everyone and to all the participants that came to um, let people know about these um, webinars um, that uh, TNAFA and NASA are putting out. Um, and you can link them to them in the, the YouTube channel for NASA. And, and thanks to Mariah for really just all the hard work that you've been doing to make sure that these go through flawlessly, that we have like all of the, the tech and the media together. Um, and it's, it's amazing, the, the work that you do. And so we're really, really grateful to, to NASA and to you for, for putting all that together for us on this. And um, it is 426 and I would love it if Sewa and Glenda just wanna leave us with some, some final words in the next couple minutes. Hmm. Do you want to go? go? <laughs> um, I, I can go just as like a final thought. Um, as a, I remembered what I was going to say is, um, you know, our food systems and what I'm realizing in this work is like the reclamation of rites of passage. So the things that we do from birth to like walking to like all, all these different things, um, those bundles are are like totally and wholly surrounded by um, the foods that we depend on and and how we and how we begin to do that work. And I feel like as we do the rites of passage reclamation for our nations, um, it's that work has like shifted my entire kind of like thinking as to like how and why it's so important to reclaim our food systems. Um, and so, uh, you know, as you begin this work, um, don't limit your idea of midwifery and birth work to the time of birth. Look at how that time of birth builds nationhood. 
it builds connections, it builds a strong family, that strong family is like surrounded by this, um, by an, a, like an environment that provides all of the food and Mother Earth and all those connections. And so um, never limit these things to what the medical model has like shown us that is important. Because when we look at our culture, our identity and nationhood, it is all of those um, all of those things and all of these practices that make up indigenous midwifery. So I just wanted to leave on that kind of like note as well. Sewa. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a, yes, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was, I'm just, I'm really inspired. Thank you so, so much uh, to everybody. And, um, you know, just wanted to just be transparent. We were just trying to have a nice like dialogue and, and share a little bit about, about not just, like the work we do but like why it's so important and to inspire other people that maybe are in these roles and how they they could just look so different and they can evolve and grow and you know you could go this way or that way but it's all centered around this this beautiful way of traditional indigenous foodways and yeah just if anybody would like to talk more please contact me and i'm just really honored thank you uh nikki mariah um clayton thank you for having us and thank you so much glenda Check out this yeah, here. Thank you guys. Hey, hi. Thanks, everyone.